Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Miss Angela's biology class. I am Miss Angela. In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at hominid evolution. Now, it's important at this point of the video, if you haven't watched my human and ape similarities and differences in the skeleton, you should go back now and watch that video. I have linked it above, so you should go watch that. Otherwise, we're going to dive into how to tell the difference between all the hominid skulls, their skeletons, how to look for key features, as well as what to expect in exam questions on this particular topic, because it seems like there's a lot you need to know. But actually, I'm going to show you that you don't really need to know too much about all of them, but rather you need to know the trend and the change of the skeletons over time. Now, if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed with your notifications turned on because I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. And if you're in matric and you're thinking about giving an A in the finals, make sure that you are a member. You get access to my study guide as well as members only live lessons and videos. Now, to start off, I need to point out some key skills that you're going to need in order to be really good at this topic. The first thing you need to be able to do is you're going to have to be able to identify key features on skulls or skeletons. And you're going to need to tell me why those changes, those developments were important. The next important skill that you are going to need for your exams and tests is you're going to need to be able to show how skulls or skeletons have progressed with time and you're going to have to show a trend in other words how something has changed shape over the course of its evolution so we're going to start off first of all with the skull differences now there are some really important skull differences that you need to know the first one is linked to bipedalism and bipedalism is associated with the foramen magnum now if we look at the diagram on the left hand side i'm going to highlight the foramen which is the opening into the skull where the spinal cord enters towards the brain and you'll notice that its position is different in each of these organisms now this particular picture has been arranged from oldest to newest skull starting from the top with the oldest and the newest at the bottom but I want you to notice that the first organism has its foramen more backward the middle organism has moved slightly forward and then the human has it way more forward now a word that we really really want to avoid in tests and exams is the word central or centrally Please do not use this word when you talk about the foramen magnum. You don't want to use that word. Instead, what you want to sh uh, you should be using is more forward. Or if you're trying to describe the fact that um, it's further back, then you would just say more backwards. But you don't want to use the word centrally when we're discussing the foramen. So every time you think of bipedalism, I want you to think about where is the foramen magnum? Where is its location? And that then tells us it, whether or not the organism was bipedal. So the more forward the foramen magnum is, the more bipedal the organism was. And that means that they were upright and upright posture walked on two legs. And that's because they wanted to hold all their body weight over the center of their body. The next thing I want to talk about is the brain size. Now the brain size is linked to how big the cranium is on the inside, right? So I've got this picture here on the right hand side and you'll see alongside it has uh, a number and the word or the letters CC. Basically, CC means cubic centimeters, and it's referring to how much like liquid or fluid you could fit in the center. Now, you'll notice a collection of five skulls here, and um, they're increasing in capacity. And when there's an increase in brain size, there is an increase in intelligence. Now, the last thing I want to highlight that we can see in the skull is going to be the canines and specifically the size of the canines. Now, this is really important. So if we look at either one of these diagrams, we'll be able to see that the canines are actually changing size. And in some of these, it's actually really difficult to be able to see them quite clearly. 
But that's really important because you need to see, again, focus on the trend of the canine. The canines were getting smaller with time. So they become smaller over time. And that's one way you can look at a skull and go, oh, that's a very old skull. It's got really large canines. That skull's got much smaller canines, so it must be newer. And you, again, may be asked to arrange skulls from oldest to newest, depending on these features. So you've got to know what you're looking for. So the next piece of evidence and physical characteristic we need to look at when ordering our skulls in the hominids is prognathism. And prognathism refers to the lower jaw and the size of the lower jaw, as well as the shape of the face that it creates. Now, in gorillas, they have a really large prognathous jaw. We can see that here. In Homo erectus, one of our um, family members, it's, it has um, reduced in size, but still prognathous. Whereas humans, um, it has reduced greatly, and the effect it has is also on the slope of our face. You'll notice that the gorilla has quite a sloped face. The Homo erectus has a lesser sloped face, but unfortunately, this little slope happening over here means that it still has a prognathous jaw, Whereas humans have a very flat face, which means we are non-prognathous. Now, again, this is where terminology is so important. When you are talking about the skull as seen in the gorilla and in Homo erectus, we are going to need to use the word that uh, it is a prognathous jaw. But you don't get less prognathous. So that's really key. Please don't use the word less. You can either have a prognathous jaw or if you are a homo sapien like us, then you have a non-prognathous jaw. And it's important that you know how to use the difference because in an exam, that is all they will accept. Now, the next important feature that you need to be able to explain and identify is going to be the palate shape. Now, the palate shape um, is quite easy to tell the difference because it's changing shape from a more rectangular long, almost like a snout, like a long nose shape. And it goes from that rectangular shape to being slightly more arched, like a U, and then finally what we would call a parabolic arch. So it's way more arch and it flares out at the bottom. Now, this shows a change in diet. It shows a change in the actual face structure. And so what you will be asked to do is you might get these unlabeled and you would have to say which one's the chimp, which one's the Australopithecus, and which one is the modern human. And basically, you're going to use the shape to help you identify them. You can also use this other structure over here called the diastema. You will notice that it is present in both the chimpanzee over here, but also to a slightly lesser degree in the Australopithecine. And a diastema is the little empty space that you would have next to your canine so that your upper canine can lock into your lower canine. And that's what you see with like animals with really large teeth. Their canines sit next to each other and they almost like sit um, outwards. So they're more prominent and, and, and more scary looking. Um, and that's another reason why we've also lost the size in our canines is we don't use them anymore to tear meat to uh, to tear raw vegetation. Everything is cooked. We don't need to scare each other off anymore with our teeth. And so the need for that has disappeared and our canines have also gotten smaller because of that. The next important facial feature that we need to focus on again, and you can use this to rank your uh, skulls from oldest to newest, is going to be the cranial ridge and the brow ridge. Not the same thing. Um, sometimes the cranial ridge is also known as the sagittal crest. So let's start off with that one, the cranial ridge. Now I've got a human, a gorilla, and a chimpanzee here. And essentially what you can see, if you know what you're looking for, is the cranial or the sagittal crest is really prominent on our gorilla. You'll notice that humans don't have one. We're just nice and smooth on the top. And our chimpanzee doesn't have one either, actually. And that's to show that um, out of these three individuals, who's more closely related? Well, the human and the chimpanzee. Um, another one that you might see is an australopithecine, um, and they would have a slightly reduced uh, cranial ridge or sagittal crest. And remember, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to show how things go from being the biggest 
to the smallest, like the canines, or if we're talking about the cranium, we're talking about how the cranium started small and then got bigger with time. Now, this other key, key feature that I want you to look out for is the brow ridge. And again, I'm going to start with the gorilla because it's really prominent. This is the brow ridge over here. And it's nice and easy to see it in the front of the skull. You'll notice that humans barely have one. It's really, really small and reduced. Whereas the chimpanzee, on the other hand, has quite a prominent brow ridge. Now, the brow ridge is linked to the jawbone and the chewing muscles, as well as the cranial ridge, because that's where all your chewing muscles attach to the top of your head. So if they're asking questions like, why did the brow ridge disappear? Why did the cranial ridge disappear? It's because we started cooking our food, we chewed our food less, and so we didn't need as large muscles to do so. And then we started using our mouth for other things, which would be like speaking and language. Now, the final key, key, key skeletal structure that I need you to know and be able to tell how it changes over time is going to be the pelvis. Now, the pelvis links also to bipedalism, so this is also important to explain that. But essentially, what you need to be able to show is how the pelvis has changed over time. Again, you may be given a whole bunch of pelvises and that are not labeled, and you have to say, which one is the human? And which one is the chimpanzee? And which one is the transitional animal? In other words, the animal that is transitioning from one hominid to the next. In this example, it would be the Australopithecus africanus. But let's say it's not labeled. What are you going to look for? Right. So the key and important thing that we need to look for is linked around the uh, length in terms of how long it is but also how wide it is. And so that's the thing that we are going to look for. Now, in chimpanzees, they have very long and they have very narrow pelvis. The Australopithecus africanus, on the other hand, is less narrow, but not completely broad like ours. And it is reduced in length, right? It's gotten a little bit shorter, but not as much as ours. Our pelvis and our pelvic bone, on the other hand, is what we would describe as being broad, which means that it is wide, like this, and it is short. And if you compare it to the chimpanzee, it is very, very much so short, because if we were to like draw them evenly if they were in terms of their height and if you measured from the bottom here to the top and the bottom here to the top the chimpanzee is much 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 longer and so that's what you are looking for you are looking for organisms that show change over time and they could be what we consider an intermediate which is what we see here, we see here with the australopithecus now I want to show you some examples of like pictures you might be given so that you know what to expect if you get this in an exam and what they're going to ask you. Now, the first thing they may ask you in an exam is a question based off of a phylogenetic tree, like the one we see on the left hand side here. And essentially, they might ask you how many millions of years ago did Australopithecus africanus appear? So you've got to go on to your... Um, diagram and you've got to measure along and you sort of like draw a line going across here you see where it intersects and you give the year right other things might be like who's more closely related to each other uh homo neanderthalus to homo sapiens or homo sapiens to homo erectus and you're going to have to explain that well homo sapiens uh only share let's see one to three, four, five common ancestors with Homo erectus, but Homo neanderthals share, let's change the color, one, two, three, four, five, six common ancestors, which means they're more closely related. Now, by the way, if you weren't sure how I did this little thing, like how did I know? Well, every time the branches branch out, that's a little common ancestor. And so that common ancestor counts as a little individual that we must count. And the more you have, the more you're uh, related to each other. There are many other things they can ask you, which can include names of famous and well-known fossils. 
And so for Ardipithecus, there's really only one we need to know, which is Ardi. For Australopithecus afarensis, there is Lucy and the Latoli footprints. For A. africanus, there's the Taong child, Mrs. Plez and Littlefoot. And yes, you will also need to know who discovered them and in what country they were discovered. So what to expect in exams? I've got two different pictures alongside here. And I'm going to start with a picture on the right-hand side. Now, you get this picture in the exam. And the first question uh, is, which organism is the human? And uh, let's say they have letters, because that's also going to make this easier. So this is A, this is B, and this is C. So which one is the human? Now, right off the bat, I already know that A is going to be the human. Why? Let's say that's the follow-on question. They say, give two visible reasons why. So we've got a lot of visible reasons that we can pick on. And I'm going to highlight some. Number one, you can talk about the foramen magnum and its location. Number two, you can talk about the shape of the pelvis if you compare them to the other three. Um, the next thing is that you can compare the size of the cranium. It has the largest cranium out of all of them. You can also talk about the reduced canines. So there's a lot that you can actually talk about just by looking at the skeleton. The next question you might interact with is they're going to ask you to order the skulls from um, oldest to newest. In other words, who is the least related and who is the most related? And in this instance, I'm going to say it is going to be C, then B, then A. Now, how did I get that? Well, again, I looked at the skeleton. The first thing that gives away the clue is, as always, the foramen magnum. And you'll notice that the foramen magnum is moving more forward with each of these until we get to the human. The next thing, again, and you should be able to provide this reason, is the shape of the pelvis. The pelvis started long and narrow. It got broader and wider and shorter until it was completely broad and short. You could even actually talk about the teeth as well. You will notice, actually, let's remove that. You will notice that the canines are really large in the chimpanzee. They are reduced in the Australopithecine, and then they are barely visible in the humans. That's another way I knew how to actually rank these. The follow-up question that can also go with this, everybody, is something like this. Using the evidence in the diagram, explain how changes to the skeleton supported bipedal movement. Now, it's important to know this, everybody. The center diagram, this one here, is not useful to explain bipedalism. Nothing about the cranium, nothing about the teeth is going to help you explain why we walk on two feet. The most important things here is going to be the pelvis. So you're going to discuss the pelvis shape and the fact that it's wide um, and short and it provides support and holds the body upright with all the weight evenly distributed. And the second thing you want to talk about is the foramen magnum being more forward, which means that it supports an upright body movement. It evenly distributes the weight and it allows the spine to be more flexible. And that's what you are going for when you're describing this in the exam. Now, if we move to the other diagram, again, you could have six skulls that you need to arrange. Now, the key things that I would use, if they said to you, arrange these six skulls from oldest to newest, what are you going to do? So there are key features that you can use to arrange them from oldest to newest. The first thing you're going to look for is the brow ridge, remember, which is this bit up here. Now, the brow ridge actually reduces over time. It gets smaller. So what do you need to do? You need to arrange these skulls from biggest brow ridge to smallest brow ridge. The next thing that I would look at, which is very easy, is how big the cranium is. So we need to arrange these skulls from the smallest cranium to the largest cranium. The next and uh, most uh, easiest feature to look for is the teeth, the canines. Again, you're going to arrange these skulls from the largest canines to the smallest canines. And those three things are probably the easiest to arrange them from oldest 
to newest hominids in an exam. The good news is, is that they very rarely give you one skull. They always give you another skull to work with and compare to, and that makes us much easier. Now, as always, I like to finish off my lesson with a terminology recap. Please use these words when you're describing how hominids have changed over time and explain how those changes have impacted how we walk on two legs, how we cook our food, um, how our structures in our body have changed over time. Those pieces of evidence that I've just run through now are really important and you must use the terms. Speaking of which, bipedalism is again the most important term when we talk about hominids. So you need to know how the pelvis, the foot, the foramen magnum all contribute to bipedalism. And remember, if you can't see it in the picture and they ask for a visible reason, don't give one that you can't see. The next thing we spoke about was the position of the foramen magnum. And remember, it is more forward or more backward. We spoke about the size of the cranium, and that is linked to how much brain capacity you have. The bigger the capranium, the more brain you have, the smarter you are. We spoke about the canines getting smaller over time, and that's because we cooked food and we chewed less. We also spoke about the prognathous jaw, which is the very large protruding jawbone that reduces over time. Remember, you either have a prognathous jaw or you don't. We spoke about the palate shape changing over time. Again, that's linked to diet and the fact that we don't need large canines anymore. We spoke about the cranial ridge or the sagittal crest, which was that bone that sits on the top of your cranium. Again, you either have it or it is reduced. And in humans, we don't have it at all because we don't need it anymore. And last but not least, the brow ridge, the bone that sits just above your eye. It is uh, pretty much completely absent in humans or very, very reduced in humans, whereas it's much, much larger in our ancestors. And that's what you're going to look for. You look, look for a brow ridge reducing over time. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed because I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.